We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. You're listening to Founder Stories with Anouk and Barack. Brought to you by F2 Capital in partnership with IDC International Radio and No Camels. A lot of times you see it, people don't know what they want to do in their career. They don't know. And they're stuck. And they stay at home or they go to university. I have so many friends that went to university to understand what they want. And I'm like, no, that's not the right strategy. You need to try things. Try them. And only when you try, you have the real experience. And then you know. It's like Steve Jobs said, I'll know it when I'll see it. And it's like love, right? You can't predict if you're going to love a woman or a man or whatever. You need to date them and to try that shit and to see if it works. Hi, and welcome to Founder Stories. Today with us is Eitan Levitt, who co-founded Mixtiles in 2015 with a mission to become the standard way for people around the world to mount photos on walls. Eitan has taken that astonishingly simple concept to grow a business generating tens of millions of dollars and employing talent all over the world. He's been coding since 1997 and is well known and loved in Israel for mentoring founders with lessons learned from his past failures and success. Eitan, you're a four-time entrepreneur and two-time father. How is growing startups like raising kids? <laughs> what are the rules? Wow. What are the You didn't rules? see that one coming. No, that was fast. So I have a nine-year-old girl and an 11-year-old boy. And he just woke up late today and I sang him a song just before leaving for this interview, like, which is in English, good morning, man, why aren't you awake? And, we have to uh, try that anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? It's, it's interesting. I always think about kids that they have this internal growth engine. And that's like one of the amazing things about kids, which is that they change all the time. And I think <laughs> that's actually very different from startups. Kids grow alone. Like in the end of the day, you don't need to do anything and they grow mm. and they change and they live, level up in a lot of ways. And startups as the founders, a lot of times they don't grow and level up unless like there's a lot of focused and concentrated effort. And even that <laughs> sometimes fails. Interesting. So I guess that's like an interesting anecdote. Are you raising your kids the way you were raised or are you trying to do things differently? Well, I think you learn from good example and from bad example. So I try to use both. My dad had this saying, he always told me as a child that if I want a book or an after school activity, the answer is always yes. So that's something that I have with my kids. On the flip side, I guess I'm more attentive to their emotions. And like my daughter and I, I think we're both pretty extreme extroverts. So I shared a lot of the difficulties I had as a elementary school kid. And she actually just had the same experience. And I think my dad was just not equipped or my, my, my mom also, like they weren't equipped with the level of understanding and knowledge that we have. Yeah. In some ways it's scary. I mean, we are so much more aware of their needs that it's more difficult because we know what's at stake. We know that we came out with some scratches and bruises, because of how our parents were, and they they didn't have that same level of understanding. And uh, it's it's kind of hard to go around with kind of like an open heart and uh, open mind. It's not yeah. that easy. Yeah. In general, I think, like, I have this theory that we haven't still seen the beginning of the effects of computers and internet on humanity. And it's like just the beginning. And I think we're now just starting to see the effects on democracy and like i just think about so many generations now um growing up with the internet and, and knowing so much and huge changes and like we're part of this huge experiment that's going to be fascinating to see where it takes us yeah so Eitan, you're the co-founder of mixed tiles and to be completely honest with you when uh, barack suggested you as a as a guest i looked at mixed tiles and it's a company that prints 
frames to put on walls. Yeah. And, and, you know, some of the people that we've interviewed were companies that have huge vision to, to change loneliness in older adults with uh, robots and big, huge visions with uh, very deep technology. I also asked uh, Barack why he <laughs> <laughs> wanted to be on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to that. Uh, let's go from the beginning. On LinkedIn, your education says Di Shalit School. Yeah. There's no fancy degree from the Technion or an MBA program. Oh, I didn't go to university. That's it. To is, a college is, or, yeah. Is higher education overrated? Yeah. Do you want that for your kids? I think it's a tool and not a goal, unless it's a goal because you fancy it and then it's cool. And what's the, But I just think, I think a lot of... The Shalit is a, high, is a high school. I didn't even get the high school diploma. Is it the Harvard of high schools? I mean, you put it with pride or... Oh, no, no. It's like <laughs> I didn't even choose it. Uh-huh. It's like the city chooses for you. And I, even, I left it when I was 17 and a bit. I left like also my parents' home. I live, uh, went to live... What year was that? Uh, 99. And I noticed you also started coding at 96. I started working. Working at 96. a web, web Yeah, I, I actually started coding when I was uh, nine years old. My dad bought a 386DX to whatever PC and uh, how to program basic book. And it was just pretty easy and interesting. And then also in order to play games, you had to configure the config sys and I don't even remember, auto exec dot bad and all that world that Isn't existed that interesting? there. Many, many technology leaders or business leaders started because they had to program games. That's how Steve Jobs started. You had to understand how this works and how to configure it. And that led to just becoming more and more into it. And, and then did, did a light bulb go off and say, hey, I can actually make money with this skill? And that's why you dropped out of school? I just wanted to live in my own apartment. I wanted to leave my parents' place. And I worked at a startup company, so I could do it. I just want to interject on the previous statement that other companies have a big vision. So our, our vision is basically to become the standard way people put photos on walls. And we think it's a huge thing. What's common between the prehistoric human and, and 2019 human? A desire to uh, leave an imprint. Yeah, like you go to caves and you see uh, wall decoration, right? So it's, it's something that's still common, this desire to express yourself on your walls. <laughs> we don't understand why, but it's a very basic thing. And we think it's very impactful. Like my mom was hospitalized for a few days and she's okay and everything. But when she was hospitalized, I I bought her some mixed tiles and I put it on her hospital room's walls with pictures of her grandkids. And the effect on her psyche, like turning that room from a white, bleak tubes from the wall room where like you feel the aroma of you know, disease and death and suddenly like just actually see people you love. Just amazing how much it changes. And it's amazing to see somebody move to a new apartment and having the walls empty and then filling them. And then the apartment suddenly feels like it's their place. There's so much emotion and so much self-expression and so much joy around interior design. If you think about it, interior design is also a category that we spend a lot of money on. Uh, which I think just implies how valuable it is to us. So, I mean, we think wall decoration is huge. Currently, mixed styles is just one size, and we just started. Just started, but it has how many so the customers? La- the, and- uh, the last number we reported was that in 2018, our revenue was $35 million, and we have hundreds of thousands of customers and a large amount of walls that have mixed styles on them. So are you going to stick with printing photos on the wall or are you moving to to hanging plants and what you envision for mixed tiles for the next 10 years? Yeah, so we have what we call the short-term vision and the long-term vision. And the short-term vision, I think, if we don't accomplish it, I would be a bit disappointed, which is, so mixed tiles today is the world's simplest way to take a photo from your phone to your wall. And it's like 70% more affordable and it's easy to order from your phone, and it sticks to your wall without nails. How does it not remove the paint? So it's two things. It's a special adhesive material that's not flat. It it can handle rough walls, and not only just flat walls. And the frame itself is super lightweight. It's like five times more lightweight than traditional frames. And that's also an important part of it, because if it's very heavy, you need to use a very strong adhesive, and then the adhesive damages the wall when you take Mm. it out. 
So how did you go from coding geek to wall decorations? Wow. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I just, I love creating stuff. I think that's the core, the creativity part. I found an amazing partner, David. Uh, We're best friends. We enjoy doing ambitious, big, non-trivial things together. Uh, we, we mostly just enjoy creating together and we really complete each other. Sounds romantic. Yeah, almost. Yeah, I told him that I wish <laughs> I wish we were both uh, also attracted to each other and then <laughs> that's it, full house. <laughs> uh, when did you but, meet uh, David? <laughs> I met him, let's see, I think six years ago. And how old are you now? I'm almost 37. I just wrote on my Facebook. <laughs> Reminder to everybody, we're all going to die someday. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and I, I find it uh, an empowering statement. Like, I think uh, life is short. You, like, you should focus on what's important and, and on joy and trying to, to make the best of it. Talking about focusing on what's important. As we said, you have two kids. How does work-life balance work for you? Do you feel like you have it? Did the startup life impact it negatively in the past when your previous startups failed? I don't think in a material way. I definitely think it affected my failed marriage. <laughs> I mean, I'm divorced also for like around six years. I, I just recently came to understand that I want two more kids. So uh, that's a big thing. How for did me. you make that calculation from two to four? Don't you want to start with one and see how it turns out? So it all started. I convinced my ex-wife that I'll take the kids with me to do one year in New York in Manhattan, that they'll uh, get great English and that they'll see the world. And we went there for three months and then it was too hard. <laughs> Uh, you guys came to Israel right ten years ago, yeah, and like I yeah. learned how hard it is to move to a new country and to lose your real social network, your real friends, family, the people you love, and just after three months, I was like, "Look, I'm gonna go back nine months from now. I just have to. I don't want my kids to not see their mom for so long." She came visiting every month. Uh, we live next to each other today, and that's how I want my kids to grow up. Anyway, this whole relocation thing really taught me about the power and importance of relationships in life. So that was actually a a very emotional thing that I experienced that led to this logical conclusion. And once I reached that logical conclusion that relationships are important, I started optimizing towards that in every area of my life. So I thought about who are the people I really enjoy and love the most. So my dad is a huge part of it. Started meeting him much more than I used to meet him in the past. And not in like family settings, but one-on-one settings. Like let's go have a drink, let's go do stuff. And I offered him to start a podcast together uh, just last week. And also kids are probably the strongest relationship you can have because what makes a good relationship is like trust, transparency, being authentic, growing together. And with kids, it's like built in. <laughs> I'm so happy we're recording this because whenever we have a tough day or we're lost, we're just going to play Eitan in our ears. <laughs> yeah. No, by the way, yeah, kids are also... Where of, were of you course, all there, 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 there are a lot of prices that you pay, right? But And kids is, is actually a tragic thing because if you think about it, in the beginning, they're with you 100% of the time. And I think the relationship improves all the time. But as it improves, they also become more distant from you until... When they're 18, 21, 25, don't, don't go they, there. They, 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 rattle they see you once a week or once a year and just think about how crazy that is. So I want to like in the startup world, there's like daily active user, right? Monthly active user does like these metrics. So I want to have at least two active kids between the ages six and 12 <laughs> at any given point of my life. I think, I think that's a great optimization. I think that's like... <laughs> that's an amazing way that, to think of right? it. Right? <laughs> you know, as you said, you made $35 million in revenue last year. How did uh, being profitable affect you in your personal life? I guess you went from startups that weren't successful to one that is. How are you spending your money? Are you living large? Mixa is my fourth company. My first one was nicely successful, and, and I had some uh, success, also financial success from it. And then I had two companies that actually failed. By the way, one of them was also almost acquired by WeWork, and I was almost the CTO of WeWork. Um, you would have been flying on private jets smoking weed. I don't think I would last there for more than a few months. <laughs> and by the way, I said no, and then I was pressured by investors and my partners, and I said no like three times until I was, okay, if nobody wants to continue doing this company, let's sell it to WeWork. And then that deal fell through, and then the company just... Uh, Perished. Uh, Which we, one? We, you or WeWork? 
No. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was a cheap shot. Yeah. <laughs> so my previous two companies failed and I, I went through a divorce in the middle and so I was basically in pretty heavy debt. <laughs> and I always started new companies and every new company you found, you have this year where you don't have any salary. And then after you raise money, the salary you take is usually very low. It's not like it's a founder's salary. It's not a, an executive in a high-tech company salary. So I was basically losing money with alimony and, and, and previous interest from previous loans I took. It was like pretty brutal. And then when Mixstars reached the $1 million a month mark, we sold some stock and I was able to repay my debts. And people that lend me personally, I paid them double. I call it the eight on interest. I've um, heard stories from these people. They, out of the blue, they get a letter in the mail, check from Eitan. They weren't expecting it. And here there's a culture in Israel where it's okay to fail. And so the entrepreneurs often forget about the fact that people actually took their savings and trusted you with it. So for Eitan, I think to do that, to go and repay them uh, in that way with interest is truly unique. I think it's the only time I ever heard a story like that. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> for me, it was amazing because it was like this part of a feeling that we're all running a marathon and the relationship isn't transactional and, you know, it's, it's, it's bigger than that. So I liked it. And then I had money and I immediately left my super crappy apartment. Super crappy, really. I can't even start explaining how like the, the front door of the building was just shattered glass. So I mean, I moved to a hotel for two months. <laughs> My kids were happy. And then I moved to New York and uh, that was expensive, you know, living in Chelsea in Manhattan. That was very expensive, by the way. And uh, starting to taste like how the flying to New York on business class was. And also I'm a pretty big guy. So that was great for me to finally stretch my legs a bit. And in the end of the day, I just have to say that if I think like, what are the best places to spend money? So my assistant is a huge thing. I'm hoping that like, I'll also make more money. And I'm hoping to have this bigger team, uh, full time team for my personal life. Hey, Tom, before mixed tiles, you had UV and U-Sight. Can you tell us about those two companies? Yeah, so UV named after my daughter. UV is her nickname. Yuval is the full name. It was a family photo sharing app. At that time, it was very hard to share photos inside the family. You had to use email or Dropbox, which, were, which was crappy. For Israelis, WhatsApp, or for people using WhatsApp, you could only share one picture at a time, and that took a lot of clicks or taps. Everything sucked. So uh, that was my attempt to solve that problem, which was a mistake, because I basically built a feature an existing app. So Apple just in the middle of UV, Apple launched uh, shared photo streams and WhatsApp started supporting 10. Anyway, yeah. UV, Interesting. So UV was family sh uh, photo sharing. And U-Site? u, -Site? u was a site builder for people that don't know how to handle Wix and Weebly and all the drag and drop interfaces. So it was this wizard that you would say, okay, I'm a personal trainer. And then we'd ask you, oh, yeah, what ca which categories in personal training? Do you have articles, tips, photos, gallery, blah, blah. And we would just build websites for you, and, and you would just choose which website you want from very different designs. And UV was very much born out of the ashes of U-Site. And I believe you put everything you had, every dollar, every effort into U-Site, and it all failed. How did you cope with failure? I mean, how can we be sitting here today with the successful Aton at Mixed Styles? coming on the back of not one, but two failed startups. I really wanted to succeed, I guess. Did you ever doubt yourself? Yeah, sure, a lot of times. There was this nice quote by Yossi Vardi that says, every entrepreneur has a limited amount of failures. In the end of the day, you will not fail, which was like a very inspirational quote for me. Yeah, my strategy was just to continue going as long as I can. I'm just tearing up. <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> That's amazing. But uh, yeah, my strategy was just to continue going as much as I can. I had the amazing privilege of, of knowing how to code. So at any given moment, I knew that. And that was, by the way, the reason why I allowed myself to get into debt. Because I knew at, at any given point, I could basically eject from the cockpit and go and, and just work as a freelance developer and make you know, $200,000 a year in revenue and, and that would sort itself out in a few years. But I really didn't want to go there. I really didn't. Like for me, actually becoming an entrepreneur was this process where 
I had a dream at some point to become an entrepreneur. And then when I started doing it, it was such a good fit for me, doing my own ideas and expressing myself and not working for others. And then I just started dreaming about being able to do that full time without needing anybody else's money. And that's how I started my first company. And I succeeded. And that was such an amazing feeling. And then going back from that was I was just ready to fight. You give a popular workshop titled Mental Models for Founders. Can you tell us more about that? At some point, I was asked to give a talk in front of entrepreneurs. And I thought, what would be useful? So it's a list of mental models or angles or perspectives on entrepreneurship that I use all the time that I think are useful for entrepreneurs. For example, understanding that a startup is an organization that's looking for a product and an audience that wants that product and trying to figure out how to tell that audience that this product exists, right? The distribution channels and, and then figuring out how to capture that value in terms of how to make money out of it. And, and in the beginning, it's all theory and then you need to start proving it and you need to start experimenting. And, and a lot of times the way to experiment is to launch a product and try to get it in front of customers and, and to build a team. But, but in the end of the day, the understanding that you might be very wrong, is, and it's just a theory at this point, and constantly thinking, have I proved that part of the theory? And having this list of what are you most worried about that still might be very theoretical and you want to prove. Let's imagine we open a search engine called Google, and you know you go and it's a great search engine, but you still don't make money. So it's, it's still a theory that it's a great company. And then we figure out we can run ads right on. Is that the secret to your success at Mixed Tiles, that you're constantly testing and optimizing the product and the marketing and other aspects of the business, measuring and tracking? It's definitely our DNA in terms of how we do stuff. Like I have some ideas for products, so I just built a website and I made a commercial for it and I'm launching it to new customers on Facebook and I'm- Specifically the commercial, not the actual product. Actually, I have only prototypes of the product, but I use them to make the commercial and I use them to build a website that displays these products. Uh, it's actually launching today. Like we're gonna launch Facebook ads on it and then we're gonna also send emails to our existing customers. And the plan is that if anybody buys it, we're immediately canceling the deal. We're not even not charging them. And we're sending them an email saying, oh, sorry. See, I think that's actually that, out that's, of, it's actually out so of stock. And here's like 20 free mix styles to just make it up for you. Yeah. I think uh, that, that, which makes it for us feel good about it. And that's how we constantly do stuff. Mm. So uh, the Try, concept here, always, and, and yeah. I think people even from a, you know, our parents wouldn't necessarily get it, is you're going and advertising a product that doesn't exist just to see how popular it is in terms of how many people click the ad and come to the website and maybe leave their details. Yeah. And only after you get enough responses, we actually go and invest and build the product. Yeah. It's the complete opposite as the way things used to be done. I have this romantic idea about entrepreneurship that the reason entrepreneurs exist is that people don't know what they want. Like if I could ask you, hey, would you like X or what do you want that would improve your life? And you would give me an answer that's correct. And then I, I would just build that product, give you, you would pay me money and we're done. So then we wouldn't need entrepreneurs. We wouldn't need risk taking. We didn't need venture capital. We, we wouldn't need anything because that would just be a process. And thing is, people can't predict the value of things. They can't predict what they want from a very weird reason. Like, I don't know why. And a lot of times you see it, people don't know what they want to do in their career. They don't know. And they're stuck. And they stay at home or they go to university. I have so many friends I went to university to understand what they want. And I'm like, no, that's not the right <laughs> strategy. You need to try things. Try them. And only when you try, you have the real experience. And then you know. It's like Steve Jobs said, I'll know it when I'll see it. And it's like love, right? You can't predict if you're going to love a woman or a man or whatever, you need to date them and to try that shit and to see if it works. Eitan, I have to ask you something. You started UV at the Junction back in 2012 before I was part of it. We have 2 Capital run the Junction now. Can you tell us a bit about the Junction at that time? What was it like? Was it helpful? For me, it was amazing. It was one of the reasons I found my partner, David, today. Really? I mean, yeah. As part of the Junction, we also had this 
one week workshop at Google campus and David wrote significant parts of the Google campus educational material and he also had a lecture there so that's how I first saw him we talked Talked briefly and then after that as part of UV I had this viral video and then he approached me and wanted to hear my advice about what to do with some ideas he had and it was an amazing way to get into the Israeli startup ecosystem to meet and to get to know a lot of people it helped me raise money and it was a lot of fun it was like kind of this journey at one point I believe your official title was chief people officer why did you go for that I'll start by saying that I In general, I want to be a CEO. <laughs> and when we started mixed styles, we were like, okay, so who's going to be the CEO? And I was like, we don't know. Um, I don't know. I want to hold the ball and I want to throw it on the last second and whatever because, you know, life's short, blah, blah, blah. But, but mixed styles is a joint adventure. So we had this conversation. It was actually one of our first, air quotes, difficult conversations. But we actually don't have, I don't feel that we have this negative vibe when you have these conversations. We're very committed to logic. So that was actually one, one part of how we discovered it, right? So we were like talking about who's going to be the CEO. And then we're like, okay, I th- we think the logical way is that who is the person that's going to be the best fit, <laughs> which makes sense, right? But, you know, startups have a lot of emotion and, and you have a lot of motivation to do this and that. So David is the product person and designer and Mixtiles is a product company. And a lot of the strategy revolves around making great products and products. You know, basically reimagining a category that's huge and and how do we now make all wall decorations seventy percent more affordable, always sticks to walls, native to mobile phones, fun to use, beautiful. And I was just seeing how David kept asking me questions for, are you cool with doing uh, that I'm doing this? Are you cool with this? And And someone was like, dude, like you should be the CEO. Like you're the product person. Like you're driving the strategy. Like you don't need my approval. You need to make the decisions. And of course that I know everything. And of course that on the strategic level, it's something we do together. And then the question was what I'm going to do. It wasn't really a question because I was busy building our app and our backend and our factory systems and our business intelligence systems. And at some point, we hired Maxim, which was our VP software. And he was amazing at that. <laughs> so much better than I am. So I was like, great, like Maxim should be the VP software. And that was also the place where we were like, okay, now we want to build a team. And I was like, okay, so I'm now going to figure out how to recruit people and how to do it. Somebody needs to do it. I'm going to do it. So I did that for almost a year. And then we felt that the focus shifted to the marketing part of Mixtiles and then I shifted to um, do a lot of marketing hands-on. And now as the marketing team grows, I'm actually shifting to a new place where I'm, you know, in Apple, they had this SPG special project group where uh, that's where the iPhone came from and a lot of the high-risk, high-reward projects. Mm. Like I have now a two-people team, like me and another person. <laughs> so I'm still w- looking for a name for the team. You should be chief chameleon officer. <laughs> <laughs> All the roles you've taken on. CCO. You just blend, yes. BCC. Israel is known as a powerhouse for cyber, AI, and even now automotive. Do you think we can ever achieve that level of renown for consumer-facing companies? Do we have any edge in consumer? When we look at mixed styles, a lot of times we are put in the category called D2C, direct-to-consumer. And you see a lot of other companies like Casper, Warby Parker, Palatin, Aries. All these companies are direct-to-consumer. So this is a category that was, that's basically saying... In the old world, you had to put your product in the supermarket. And I think that Mixtiles is not a classic direct-to-consumer company because a lot of these companies, their innovation is the business model and marketing channel. The innovation is really the direct communication with the customer. But in the end of the day, the products are not innovative. It's the same mattress. It's the same shoes, maybe some design on it. And a lot of amazing branding, which I think Americans are amazing at branding and have this ability to create this pristine feeling when you look at their products and, and websites, which we as, we as Israelis suck at. And there's almost zero talent to hear for that. Mixtiles, for example, we basically reinvented how you create the product. Like we built our own machines to manufacture mixtiles. I wrote code to... 
to run at the factory floor to cut out a significant amount of costs to automate so many things. The product itself, nobody ever used the materials we're using. Nobody ever used adhesive to stick it to the wall instead of hammers and nails. Yeah, so I think Israeli companies do have an edge in consumer, and the edge is product and technology. And I think that we are catching up to marketing and branding. As distribution channels become more measurable, as just the knowledge of how to market on a global scale becomes diffused around the world, I think Israelis are really good at marketing and specifically performance marketing, which is, I think, where the world is going. By the way, Wix is a completely performance marketing-driven company, which is crazy, an $8 billion company. And what we still don't have, and I think we are improving, is the whole branding and positioning and design. I, I see Mixtiles. I see other companies sure. are becoming better Monday. at brand. Monday yeah, is, is an example I think everybody thinks of. Amazing yeah. change of name. I definitely think that Israel will be a consumer player for sure. So what's on your bucket list? What would you love to do if you had all the time and money in the world? I'm 37 years old and I'm very overweight. And I really want to lose weight. So I tried so many things. Like I can talk with you for hours about from injecting stuff to my stomach and like from standard things and to like even extreme things. You, you've uh, tested it all. Like you, I tried so like many you things. Like you do about yeah, with yeah. startups. It's stupid, but I just and, – and there's a lot of shame and guilt around it, which I think now I've overcome or at least I came to peace with the fact that I'm – overweight and I, I understood that my value as a human is not only the, driven by my body, which was a very important realization for me. I leveled up in terms of life when I understood that in a deep way. Now I just want to lose weight because I want to live more and, and be able to do more stuff with my kids and to be more active. So I would work full time in losing weight. I really believe that for me, there are super high success rate if I do something in a focused way. Mm. And I'm trying now to like looking for a health farm and maybe do an experiment, go there for a week. And if that works, then do two weeks in a few months and then maybe schedule something longer. So that's something on my bucket list. Great answer. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you so Cheers. much. Founder Stories is brought to you by F2 Capital in partnership with IDC International Radio and No Camels. Subscribe now on your favorite podcast app.